speech and beyond language. And to Wittgenstein, he specifically says, he says, that's what's really most of all importance. That is what is the most important thing. That's what, so to speak, drives us. <coughs> um, that which can't be spoken about. But, um, and a lot of his critique of quite a lot of philosophy and religion is that they try and speak about that which can't be spoken about. They try and reach with language what can't really be put into language. Um, um, and so, um, you, you, um, you've got, you, you've got, so that, that's why he speak, he writes so different in such a difficult way. See that in the Tractatus, which is the only book he ever published in 1922 or so. The Tractatus is this very difficult book, and then it ends up by, see, by saying, if you understand the proposition, me, you will understand that all the propositions in this book are nonsense. You see. And this, of course, as you can imagine, has intrigued, still does intrigue philosophers. So what the hell is he getting at? Because you, you've got to have a uh, 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 a bit of, um, you know, something round your head to understand the track. It's an extremely difficult um, book. Um, but you, you swept your way through it, and then he says you've got to recognize that it's all nonsense. You see, and that's, that's the paradox. So he's always right, and later on he doesn't put it quite like but he's always writing paradoxical. You see, you've got to look at language, and then you've got to look at what language can't say. Because he says what language can't say is what is important. <clears throat> um, to just to give a clue to this, um, I should mention a bit of logic, which people, uh, Wittgenstein is of course a very able logician. His, one of his, his really most important discovery in logic is that all logical propositions he showed can be, are ultimately tautologies. Now a tautology is a thing like Either it is raining or it is not raining. Now think of that statement. Now that's a perfectly good English statement. But you do not have to look at the world to see whether it's true or not. Do you understand? If I say either it's raining or it's daylight, or it's, um, you, you look out the window to see if it's true or not. Do you understand? You'd have to look out the window. Oh, it's daylight, it's not raining. But if, we, if I say either it's raining or it's not raining, well, this is, this is true. You don't have to look anywhere. In other words, you don't have to look at the empirical world to see whether it's true or not. Do you understand? So that he, he's showing that language is um, fundamentally not empirical, you see, which would be one of the, of course, criticisms that he makes, and I, would make, I do make in the book of... Um, quite a lot of psychoanalysis and psychotherapy because Freud does go on and on about that it's an empirical subject and uh, I, I argue with Rick Steiner that it's not an empirical subject because psychotherapy is deeply or the talking cure as I said is deeply concerned with language and you, to, to give a bit of history this comes really from, from mathematics these mathematicians in the latter part of the 19th century that, they, that showed that Frege is the, is the name, of course, that showed that mathematics in the early part of the 19th century was in a muddle about things like infinity and so on and so forth. And Frege and other mathematicians, so to speak, cleared it up and showed that, that our mathematics cannot be an empirical subject. Um, you just need to really think of the concept of infinity. You won't find infinity anywhere, just for um, But infinity is absolutely crucial to our um, modern mathematics. Um, you just need to think of the calculus, um, which um, it involves infinity all the time. Uh, and yet, but where is infinity? Nowhere. So, to put it, so he, he would say ultimately the reality of the world is beyond description, it is imageless. The doorway through which one enters is the doorway which cannot be sought. 
is beyond imagination description. It is non-conceptual. Um, I'm going fairly fast here. He, to quote him, says, My propositions are elucidatory in this way. He who understands me finally recognizes them as nonsense. When he's climbed up through them, on them, over them, he must, so to speak, throw away the ladder after he's climbed up on it. Now, this sounds very mysterious, but actually it's much closer to psychotherapeutic experience than you might think, because patients very rarely um, say, well, I now see you've got a wonderful theory, and um, that is what is cured. Um, the best analysts know that um, <coughs> you go out, if you're not using ordinary language, <coughs> you, you, you don't, no, no, I don't you, you don't, it, it's not theories that people will say at the end of um, reasonably successful treatment, things like, well, I, can, I think I can manage now, or I don't think I'll get depressed anymore, things like that. They don't say, well, your theory was absolutely the right one, if you see what And this is very, very important. You see, so this is really what Wittgenstein is saying. See, that, they, that, that you convey, I, I would claim that in psychotherapy, you convey something which is really uh, beyond thought and beyond um, what can be said. I mean, think of um, the word happiness. You see, you, ca you cannot tell people how to be happy any more than you can tell people how to be neurotic. I'm depressed, feel rotten, and so on and so forth. You can't tell me, um, well, do this, do that, or we'll get that. Well, it's not very successful if you, if you, are. you might say, well, cheer up. <laughs> you know, and so on and so forth. But all of you know um, that this isn't really very successful. But there's always something that is beyond work. In, um, in psychotherapy. So he, he fits rather well with that. Um, yes. Um, so he, he says later on uh, what gives meaning is the life led by those who live by it. He was very interested in meaning. And here we come into a critique, his critique of uh, Freud's um, book on dreams. He says, um, Freud is, um, is perfectly all right to say all dreams have a sexual meaning. But he, he, what, what, where Freud is wrong is to think that they rarely have a sexual meaning. What he means is that, um, that Freud's view, for, for, that's what Freud took to be the meaning of the dream, if you see what I mean. Uh, uh, you see that if, if, for example, I say, well, it's rather hot in here, open on the window, and you don't, don't know English very well, and you go and open the door, of course I would say, no, look, open the window, this, this is what I mean, open this. So that would be the meaning, if you like. But it's, it's, a, it's simply a particular meaning. It's the meaning, what, what I mean. In, in other words, our meaning and there's, there's a very, very big literature on this, is um, contextual. Um, is, meaning is deeply contextual. In other words, um, Wittgenstein says, well, Freud is all right to say in a Freudian analysis that your meaning, fundamentally, uh, the meaning of your dream is sexual. And he says that that, um, undoubtedly, is a very useful thing to say. Uh, certainly, probably, in... Um, 19th century Vienna and uh, the early half of the 20th century because Freud is uh, probably quite correct that many people pretend, pretending that in a way sex didn't exist and he was trying to show them um, the importance of sex, sexuality in life. But if you say but Big Sam would quarrel with Freud if, if Freud says that is the meaning Instead of saying, this is how I understand, this is how Freudian understands dreams, he says, um, this is the meaning of dreams. And Wittgenstein will say, well, other people, um, human dreaming, dreaming is a very, very common human 
on activity, and that in actual fact anthropologists have said that there are certain tribes in which the, it's the custom to always tell your dreams at the beginning of the day, and, and they interpret them. And um, he would say, well, well